I'd like to thank uh, Bob for inviting me. I've uh, been here a couple of times when my former student, Alex Kantarovic, was here. First time ever was in 1969. It was an analytic number three conference. So th this talk is about um, super positivity of L functions. So uh, let me first say a little bit about L functions. An L function is a new phase series with complex coefficients a n, and I assume that this series converges absolutely for a real part of S sufficiently large. Um, but an L function has more properties. It, it should have analytic continuation, finitely many poles. Um, and it should also have a functional equation. And the functional equation is, is usually normalized uh, s goes into 1 minus s. So you multiply this by some gamma factors, and, and then um, it'll have this kind of a functional equation. The, the most famous L function is, is the Riemann data function, where all the ans are 1. And, and then you have a boiler the product. So you could, this can also be written as a product of primes. So that many different L functions have been discovered over time. Um, the Riemann data function and the Dirichlet L functions. And then later, uh, they introduced L functions of number fields. <laughs> and then later, there were the um, geometric L functions. So if you have an algebraic variety, and you count the number of points on that variety mod p, then that you can interpret the, the p coefficient can be something like that. And then there, if you write a, a product of primes, there are conjectures that, that these things should have all the properties of analytic continuation, functional equation. Uh, so the most famous conjectures is for elliptic curves. And Andrew Wiles proved that the L function elliptic curve is, does have these properties, have analytic continuation function equation, and, um, and he proved Fermat's last theorem. Uh, that was one of the key ingredients of the proof. So, uh, that's the geometric L function. Then other L functions were discovered. They were dynamic L functions. <laughs> the Ruel, zeta function, the Selberg zeta function. These are L functions coming out of dynamics. What we don't have is a grand unification theory of all these L functions. It doesn't exist yet. But there is the Langlands L function, which covers with all the L functions known, except for the dynamic ones, should be Langlands L functions. <laughs> so th this is the Langlands uh, philosophy and the Langlands program to classify the L functions. But it does not include the dynamics of the functions. So uh, in general, if you have a group G, so for me, G would be the group GLM. Then you can look at, at automorphic functions for this group. An automorphic function is a function f, f from g into a complex number. This is an automorphic function. And I assume that sitting inside g, there's a discrete subgroup, gamma. So an example would be gl2r, and a discrete subgroup would be sl2z. And then a, an automorphic form, automorphic form, is a function that satisfies f of gamma g equal to f of g. And so you're saying without these invariance property, you just call it an automorphic function. But with the invariance property, you call no, it. No, an automorphic function is still with the invariance property. Otherwise, it's just a function on the group. An automorphic form actually is a little bit more than this. Uh, it, it, it should lie in some, some cohomology space, like it should be a differential form or something like that. 
or an eigenfunction of some differential operator. So it has to multiply by some factor that depends on gamma, is that right? No. Uh, Oh, they could back. be they could pull be back. they could be pullback factors, but I'm I'm just going to take the simplest case where the factor is trivial. So it's just a function of the quotient space. It's a function of the quotient space. So it's actually a function of gamma. So with with a left action. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a function of the in, in, in Jack A. Langland's book, they, following the Russian school of, of Gelfand, um, they introduced, they started looking at representations on this space. So a representation, you have, you have a big vector, like vector space, and a representation is an action that takes an element of the space to another element of the space. So let pi be such a representation, and uh, then you can look at pi of h acting on f of g, and this will just be equal to f of here the action is on the right. And then uh, you can, Langlands uh, and Jacquet classified these representations. And they show that to every such representation, there's a Langlands L function, L is so these, these are the L functions that, that I'm going to be looking at. And um, they have, they can be, they have Euler products. So LS pi turns out to be a product um, over primes P. I'm going to, I'm just going to be working over Q. just to keep things simple. But you can work over any field, or you can work over an Adelrian. But let's just work over Q. Then it would be a product over primes, and then it would be a product J equals 1. Um, sorry. You'll have a, a local L function, L is pi v, where pi v is a, is a, is a local representation. And these, these local factors, L is pi v, um, turn out to look like this. But I mean, then this has no meaning to me. 
like this pi. Ls pi is, pi is the global L function, which factor, this is the Euler product. Right, but how does that formula change when you should put a tilde? These alpha j's are completely unrelated to the other ones? So, the, so assuming, yeah, the, so, so for pi tilde, you will have alpha j, the conjugate of alpha j. This will correspond to the conjugate. And the uj as well. And the uj as well. So you're saying if you give us pi, there's some complicated recipe for computing the alpha j's that you're not That's right. pi minus. It's very complicated. Okay. It's not that, uh, it's, don't it's ask, quite don't complicated. Don't ask, don't it's quite complicated. But um, And, and, and this epsilon is called the root number, and epsilon s pi is equal to epsilon pi times norm of pi to the half minus. Where norm of pi is the conductor, this, this is some integer, n pi, it's not an integer, but it's greater than one. And if pi equals pi tilde, it's called self-dual. So, so let me give you an example, a very simple example of this. I will give you a simple example of this. So this is a GL1 example. This is the simple ex example that we know. So pi is equal to chi. And chi is a Dirichlet character. So chi of AB is equal to chi of A times chi of B. This is for integers A and B. And chi of A plus Q. So this is just a Dirichlet character. Okay. So it, it Q so, less than one. So chi is, it, is a character from Z mod QZ, a multiplicative group into, into the root of it. So we're on GL1, so the only representations possible are one-dimensional representations. So pi is just a character. It's a one-dimensional representation. In this case, the L function, Ls pi, is, is, um, is gamma s over 2 uh, times Ls pi. And this has a functional equation, tau of pi from the square root of q times pi q to the 1 half minus s. Gamma 1 minus s over 2, gamma 1 minus s pi bar. I'm assuming here that chi of minus 1 is plus 1. Otherwise, the functional equation is slightly different. So uh, this factor is the epsilon pi, and this is the norm of pi. And if chi equals chi bar, if chi is a real character, then it's self-dual. Otherwise, it's not self-dual. So this is this example appears already in Dirichlet's paper from 18 something, 18. All right, so I'm not going to say any more about uh, L functions, okay? So now I want to talk about superpositivity.
So the, the word superpositivity first appeared in a very recent paper by um, Shi Wei Yuin and Wei Zhang, who just won the breakthrough prize for that paper. <laughs> they introduced uh, the notion of superpositivity. I first heard about it uh, about two and a half years ago. Wei Zhang called me up on the phone. And he said, uh, I have a conjecture. I said, what is it? He said, well, I call it superpositivity. So I said, well, what is it? <laughs> he said, well, take the L function of an elliptic curve and take any derivative you want at, at a half. It should always be, you should always get, it should always be greater than zero. It couldn't, we know it has to be a real number, but, um, he said it can't be negative. It has to be greater than zero. So I went to my I went to my computer. I, I, I picked an elliptic curve. I, I I started computing the derivatives of the L function at a half, and I was getting negative answers. <laughs> I told him it's not true. I don't believe it. He said, "Did you use the completed L function?" This. Ls chi is the L function by itself. The completed L function has the gamma and the other stuff in it. You've got to you've got to have the infinity factor also. So then I redid all the computations with the gamma function, and he was right. It came out uh, super positive. And then he said, "Well, I can. We can prove that um, if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, we can prove super positivity for any." GLN L function over a local or a local field. He said we could prove that. And I asked him, well, how did you come up with this? Why did you even think about this? Well, he said, the bird sweat and die conjecture is for an elliptic curve of rank R. You have an elliptic curve of rank R, and you have an L function for the elliptic curve, that if you take the rth derivative, R is the rank of the elliptic curve of a Q. The, the, the rational points on the elliptic curve form an, an abelian group of uh, finite rank. And he said, if you take the R derivative, there's a conjecture for what that should be, and it's something positive. And, it, and we can prove it for rank 0 and 1 using the gross idea formula. And he said, well, in this what we've now found is that we can generalize this to all derivatives. But only, we can only do it over function fields. We can't do it over number fields. So what they did, what they proved is they have a new gross IGA formula for elliptic curves over function fields over a finite field. When you take any derivative, it doesn't have to be the, the rth derivative or rth rank. It could be any derivative, the trinitic derivative evaluated at a half at the central point, then it can be expressed as an inner product on, on a certain space. And this inner product is positive definite, so it has to come out positive or greater than zero. So they can actually, um, but to prove that the inner product that they have on the space they have is, is actually positive definite, they conjecture it as positive definite. They could prove it assuming the Hodge conjecture in algebraic geometry. So if you assume the Hodge conjecture for these varieties that they're looking at, then they get the positive positivity. But, but then he figured out that with the Riemann hypothesis, he could prove the superpositive. So what they end up doing is proving the Hodge conjecture for these varieties. <laughs> Using, because the Riemann hypothesis is known in the case of function fields. It's, it's, it's been proved. It's proved by the lead. So it's a remarkable work, and, and they certainly deserve a breakthrough, breakthrough prize for this. But anyway, that's how I got into this, got interested in this superpositivity. Let me, let me say um, let me say something now about the, hi the history of superpositivity. It has an interesting um, in 
trying to prove that there are no zero zeros. If, if this, if, if this Dirichlet L function had a zero in your one, it's called a zero zero. And in fact, the existence of a zero zero violently contradicts the real analysis. Um, but no one has any idea how to prove this. So the, the point is, if, if one of these had a zero near, near, near one, you could show that's the only zero. That's easy to prove. And so it can't have any other real zeros. It would be only this one real zero. That means there's a sign change. The L function is positive when S is bigger than one. It hits the zero and then becomes negative. So at a half, it would be negative. And that's, that contradicts this. So if you could prove this with the L function here, you would, you would solve a, a famous problem. I mean, that, that could win a field now, proving there's no zero field. So it, so is that actually proving superpositivity seems very hard. Of course, they proved it assuming the Riemann hypothesis. Then there's no z if, if the Riemann hypothesis holds, there's no z equals zero, no, no sign change, and there's no problem. <laughs> Polya's proof is, is very unenlightening. Now, Sarnak introduced the notion of positive definite. I want to talk about that. So th this is due to Sarnak. to be lambda of a half plus i t pi. So this is the completed L function.
we, we say that pi is positive definite if this matrix is positive definite. For, all, for, any, for any set of real numbers, for, for all n. It, it is a positive definite Hermitian matrix. And there's, then there are various, he found various equivalences of this definition. You can look at the Mellon transform of this of CT pi. I mean the Fourier transform. Let's call this H prime Y. Then pi is positive definite is equivalent to um, H pi of Y uh, greater than zero for Y uh, greater than zero. You can prove this equivalent. I'm not going to do that. So once you have this, you can then conclude various things. What's just one person? So remark. What? That's one person. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to go through it. But I mean, it's it's a. So, so this, we can make some remarks. Um, so pi positive definite implies lambda s pi has no real zeros. Pi positive definite implies pi is uh, super positive. We could prove that if it's positive definite, it's super positive. That follows. And if if f of z is a Hecke cusper. So in other words, f of az plus b over cz plus d, let's say of weight k, cz plus d to k of z, where z is in the upper half plane. This is the definition of a modular form of weight k. Um, Then, then f uh, positive definite is equivalent to, um, to f of i y uh, greater than equal to zero to y greater than zero. And that, that follows from, the, from this condition. So then, then you can ask. Um, which modular forms are positive definite? If a modular form is positive definite, and it's a very simple criteria <laughs> that f of i y should be, then you get the superpositivity. So what is the most famous um, modular form? The most famous modular form is, is Ramanujan's modular form of weight 12. The famous delta z, which is e to the 2 pi i z times the product uh, n equals 1 to infinity, 1 minus e to the 2 pi i n z um, to the 24th power. This is the famous. Then, then you can you can then see that this that that if you look at delta of i y. This is e to the minus 2 pi y, which is a positive number. And each of the, you, this has to be uh, greater than 0. <laughs> so 
So this implies that, so this, this, this function can also be written in this way. It can also be written in summation tau n to the 2 pi i and z. And, and this tells you that the L function associated to delta, which is summation tau n over n to the s, has superpositivity. <coughs> In other words, if, if you differentiate this as many times as you want and evaluate it at s equals 6, 6 is the center of these. It's analogous to a point one half. It'll always be greater than zero. Now let me, the, the history of positive definite um, L functions is, is interesting. The, it was introduced because they were trying to show that there are no real zeros for derivative L functions. I mean, if, 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 a, if, if it's positive definite, then it doesn't have real zeros. So that's what they were trying to do. But it has an interesting, an interesting history. actually falls for infinitely many cards. In 1936, Chawla repeats this false conjecture. same conjecture, that, that, that it's all real quadratic characters should be positive. In 1937, Albra repeats Hoggy's proof. That the conjecture is false. Without any reference to Habra, he just rediscovered the proof. People just forgot about it. I mean, without any reference to Paga. It seems like he just rediscovered it and just forgot it. Then in 1990, Baker and Montgomery, you and Montgomery, um, showed almost all are not positive yet. Well, may I just ask you, uh, 1919 precedes Faulkner's theorem about identifying positive definite functions. But he, had a different defini he had a different definition of positive definite. Sarnak was the one that, that made this definition. Okay. He had the other definition that the thing is, at the um, 
that the value of, of the modular form should be positive on the real on the imaginary axis. It was it a state of state in a different form. Okay. Um, Sarnak had a student in 2016, Young. Young proves that almost all L functions uh, in any reasonable family are not. I'm not talking about that. This is a student of science. And there's still an open problem. Are there infinitely many of PB of any type at all? <laughs> Are there infinitely many or not? This is still uh, an unsolved problem. Anyway, positive definite is not a natural phenomenon for L functions. Um, the reason I got so into it is, is when I saw Sarnak, what were we doing with super positivity? He jumped right away. He said, oh, that positive definite is su super positive. But super positive is very natural. We expect all L functions to, to be super positive. OK, so, so this is the history. And now I'm going to tell you uh, what we've been able to do recently. So this is, this is joint work. With Bin Ram Huang and myself. <coughs> there are infinitely there are infinitely many so that the first coefficient is 1. Otherwise, you could multiply by constant and get many things. <laughs> infinitely many Hecke cusp forms um, of weight 2 uh, uh, with the superpositivity property. In fact, uh, for any level Q, in, in other words, um, weight two modular forms uh, for gamma naught Q, gamma naught Q is the, is the matrix group A, B, C, B, where Q divides C. So, um, in fact, for any level Q, uh, at least 12% are super positive. And um, we can also prove that at least 49% such uh, L functions have no real zeros. Uh, 
good. Well, if you just get through super positivity, you get 12. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, we're, but super positivity, you need an argument for all derivatives, so it cuts it down a lot. So this is without, so, so if, if we don't have the super positivity, mm -hmm. just to get non-vanishing, we, we get 49%. What is the significance of 49? It's just the number that comes out in the proof. Okay. It should be 100%. The conjecture is that in both of these it should be 100, but this is what we can prove. And, and I imagine someone else will come along pretty soon and, and prove this a little bit. That, that's how analytic number theory works. You, you establish a record, and then a few months later, someone breaks it. So I want to, I just, um, I have 15 minutes. I want to say a little bit about um, how this is proved. So um, the key ideas, um, the key ideas for, uh, for the proof, a lot of them were already in the literature. So it's, it, there are two papers here that, that, that we use heavily. Uh, the first is um, 2002, Conway and Sound. Uh, this is their paper in Invention uh, They proved that a positive proportion of Dirichlet L functions have no real zeros. So a, a positive proportion um, of Dirichlet L and less chi have no real. And chi is real. Chi is capital. Oh, by the by the way, um, to get super positivity. You, you need, it, it, it will only really be true for self-dual forms. So I have to assume that chi is kind of have all these modular forms of self-dual, so that I don't have to mention it. <laughs> but the conjecture is that if you, if you have a family of self-dual automorphic forms, then super positive should always hold. And so they, they're trying to prove that, that they, t they look at this, here's a half and here's one. They want to prove there are no zeros on, on this. So what they do is they take a very thin region of, of thickness epsilon, and they show that they have no zeros in that, in that region. It's hard to prove there are no zeros on the line, need some region with some thickness to make the proof work. And uh, so this is the other the other work we use is the work of uh, uh, but the region is independent of the L function that satisfies this thing? What? Yeah the region all the L functions have a functional equation S to one minus S. No, this this little thickening of half to one. Yeah, it's it's independent. Uh, well, it, it it depends on on the conductor. How big it, it, it depends on the conductor. So the the other uh, paper we use is is a paper of uh, Bob on the zero density estimate for modular form L functions in the weight aspect. So we use we also use. So, so uh, our proof uses these techniques, which are known. Um, and it also makes use of that old theorem of uh, Zagier and Stark and Zagier. So, so they didn't actually prove anything about super positivity. positivity. They didn't use that word. But they proved the theorem which is equivalent to super positivity. 
And the theorem is the following. So here's a half, and here's one. And uh, you, you, you form this rectangle. So this is the point uh, one and a half. So you have this triangle. Now the Riemann hypothesis says that all the zeros are on the line one half. What they prove is, assume um, LS, um, let's say lambda s pi. This is the completed L function. Has no zeros. Let's call this triangle T in T. So if the Riemann hypothesis is true, there are no zeros there. Then pi is, is sp. Super positive. So in, in the paper of, of um, Wei Zhang and Yuin, they they showed that the Riemann hypothesis implies super positivity. So I pointed out to them that you don't need it, right? You, that this is Anyway, their paper was already accepted by Invenciones, but I think they added a remark and, and attributed this. They gave a complete proof of their result. This is so easy to prove that I'm going to show you the proof right now. They, they say every talk should have a proof of something in it. So I'm going to prove this. It's actually, if, if you know Hadamard's product theorem, then it's pretty easy to prove. So let me define lambda s to equal to, 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 to lambda of s plus a half. This is the completed L function, which has a functional equation s to 1 minus s. Then you see immediately that lambda s is the same as lambda minus s. This is the functional equation. <coughs> lambda s is entire at the order of 1. This is the Hadamard order. I'm assuming that, that pi is custom. If pi is a cusp form, then, we, then this is known, that, that this function is an entire function of, of order 1. Order 1 means f of z is of order 1 if the absolute value of f of z is at most like e to the z to the 1 plus epsilon. Just the Hadamard one. Then we have the Hadamard product theorem. Hadamard product says that lambda s is some power of s e to the a product k equals one to infinity lambda rho k of the zeros of lambda these are the zeros and then it's just one minus s squared over rho k squared. This is the head of Any book on the Riemann theta function has this in there. <laughs> now, let's assume the Riemann hypothesis. If the Riemann hypothesis holds, all these rho k's are pure imaginary. They're pure imaginary, right? So rho k squared is negative. So it would be 1 plus s squared. Differentiate this as many times as you want and set s equal to 0. It's got to be greater than equal to 0. Because every term is positive. So it just looks like an axis. 
Because if, if, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, rho k is pure imaginary. You square it, it becomes negative. So you, this is really 1 plus s squared times a positive number. And then differentiate it as many times as you want. Let s equal 0. It's got to it's be greater than 0. Can't, you can't get something negative. So where are you using that it has no zeros in t? Huh? You are just using? No, no, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't prove that yet. I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you, so if you look in, in this paper on Stuckes, uh, in, in Inventiones, that, that won the Breakthrough Prize, and in, the, in, the, in the appendix, there's a proof, of, which is basically, I just showed you the proof. Here's the proof. So now the question is, we, how can we just assume that they could only zeros in this triangle. Actually, because the functional equation is actually two triangle. These would be, it, it if you know there are no zeros here, there are no zeros here by the functional equation. So now how do we prove it for this case? So now assume then lambda beta plus i gamma is equal to zero. So beta plus i, now assume we have a zero, and beta may not be zero. If the Riemann hypothesis is true, beta has to be zero. I'm, I'm going to assume that beta is not. Let's assume we have such a zero. Well, there, there are now um, two possibilities. If beta is 0, then there exist two zeros, just a plus or minus i. So if this is the line of half, if you have a 0 at i gamma by the functional, actually not, this is not the functional equation. This is the fact that it's self-dual. It, it has to have a zero at the conjugate point. So there'll be two zeros. Now let's assume that beta is unequal to zero. Then there will be four zeros. There'll be beta plus i gamma minus beta plus i gamma, uh, beta minus i gamma, and minus beta minus i gamma. So if there's a zero off the line, by the functional equation, there'll be another zero here. By, by the self-dual, just by taking complex conjugates, there'll be a zero here. So there'll be four zeros. And now let's write this product according to both, to all these cases. And see what happens. So if you do that, So first you get s to the m, then you get e to the a. Now let's look at the, at the product of the zeros where, where beta is 0. So it's a product of, 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 of lambda of plus or minus i gamma equal to 0. So it, it'll, it'll be 1 plus s squared over gamma. But then we have these other zeros, and then it'll be a product where beta is unequal to zero, and there'll be four zeros. And if you just work it out, you get one plus two gamma squared minus two beta squared times s squared plus s to the fourth over gamma squared plus beta squared. It'll be this product o o over beta plus i gamma. Plus or minus. But if you're in the triangle, this is positive. Beta is less than gamma. So you still have all the positivity you had before. So that, that's the proof of this. So this is heavily used. We, we don't actually have to prove 
that the Riemann hypothesis holds most 49% of the time. We don't need to prove that. We just need to prove that for a positive proportion of L functions, um, that there are no zeros in this triangle. So, I guess so, so the triangle, again, uh, looks like this. So what we do is we first prove there are no zeros in a thin strip. Then we take a slightly thicker strip and then a strip and cover and keep covering it constantly. And it turns out you only need finitely many of these. And, and we use the argument of uh, Conry and sound and, and some of the brilliant techniques in, in, uh, in Bob's paper uh, with a few ideas of our own. And, um, and we can prove this. Thank you. If you're outside the triangle, so you see, zeros are outside of the triangle from your assumption, so you need to know that it is. We just need to know that, that for a positive proportion of L functions in this family, there are no zeros in that triangle. And you can do it for thin strips and you just cover it and cover the next But to make it your conclusion, this paper should be positive when zeros are outside. No, if the zeros are outside, if beta is bigger than gamma, this could be negative. So then we can't but prove you, anything. You take a protocol of all zeros, though. Right, but, 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 the, but either, the, either the zeros are what? But the you zeros. Take, you take a protocol of all zeros, so you should control the zeros outside of the triangle. <coughs> no, but, but, but the other ones, but these are the zeros outside of the triangle. Yeah. It, because it, it's only when you're inside the triangle that, that this could be negative. So I had a, yeah, I'm sorry. It, it, for, for infinitely many zeros, this is positive. Yes. And only when you're in the triangle could it be negative. You have to make an assumption. So, so you just, if there are no zeros in the triangle, then it's, you can be left with something that's positive. And, and this gives an effective method to check if, if an L function is super positive or not. You just see if there are any zeros in this triangle. So there, there's a database of all known L functions. And not only that, but they show you um, the first thousand zeros. And <laughs> so the, the no matter, if you look at any L function in the database, the first thousand zeros are on the line of half. So there are no zeros in that triangle. I mean, so, 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 so I can tell you right now that every known L function is super positive. <laughs> but your 12% explicit 12%? We can prove it at 12%. This is an effective result. And it should, it should work for, for lots. The method should work in great general for other families, many other families.